We are very excited to have this panel. Uh, before I jump in on that, a couple of things. Uh, if you would like, please use the chat at the bottom of the screen uh, for messaging back and forth with each other or with our panelists. Um, also use the Q&A function so that you can, if you have questions, put them in there. Uh, as we go along, we're going to go through the session and then at the very end, we're gonna address questions going forward. Um, so I wanna jump right into it. One last thing, I do wanna thank TASC as a co-sponsor of this event. Uh, they've been a partner of DIRs for many, many years and have been a, a continual support of the, the functions and the education sessions that we, we uh, drive out of Joey's office. So, all right, well, great. Let's get started. So uh, again, my name is Ed Kelly. I'm the Chief Data Officer and just a, a couple of thoughts. Uh, John mentioned, you know, the last 18 months and I think data has become so critical. I mean, during the COVID-19 uh, effort, we DIR were heavily involved with Health and Human Services and the Department of State Health Services on the reporting component for that. And obviously the the whole effort and the need for data, the speed to need data became relevant. Uh, lots of information, the governor's office was looking for, lots of our citizens were looking for information. So it elevated the need of having good quality data and information. Uh, I think what we've seen with obviously the last legislative session and some of the things that are still going, going with the collection of information and and the new variant coming in, et cetera, um, it's become more and more important. And uh, today's panelists are gonna have an opportunity to share with you some great information about how they have leveraged analytics, predictive analytics in their particular disciplines. So we have representation from the healthcare industry, representation from cybersecurity, security. We also have the transportation and we have local government. So I'm um, very happy to have uh, these individuals and appreciate their time. So I'm going to actually let them introduce themselves and talk just a little bit about um, their, their programs and what they're doing with uh, and leveraging predictive analytics. So I'll just kind of go down the list here. Um, Stephanie, why don't you start with your introduction, please? My name is Stephanie Bird and I help organizations protect their information and we leverage predictive analytics in cybersecurity, which is where I'm at, uh, in a variety of contexts. So I started my career in statistical analysis. I was doing research. I during my PhD specializing in applied statistical analysis from Columbia University. I worked at Ernst & Young. When I came back to America, I was in Australia, and joined academia, I just saw that there were data issues everywhere from the research personnel perspective we even had on our ID badges, we had our social security numbers. We were walking around with that. So I got a grant from the Department of Justice and started assessing the impact of information security in academic institutions, and I was hooked. So from then on, it's been interweaving the cybersecurity and statistical analysis. So thank you for having me today, Ed. Great, thank you, Stephanie, appreciate that. Um, Eamon, you wanna introduce yourself next? Absolutely. Um... First, I wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of the panel um, and to have this discussion with um, the folks in Texas and elsewhere. Um, my name is Amin Ra Mashariki. Uh, the, 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 I'm currently a principal scientist at NVIDIA, um, and I lead um, the AI for Cities initiatives um, at NVIDIA. Many of you may know NVIDIA more so on the gaming side, but NVIDIA uh, as a company has grown um, by leaps and bounds in the AI space. And so I really spent a lot of my time at NVIDIA working with other companies uh, to partner with cities uh, to and, and, and states uh, to implement uh, AI solutions, um, GPU accelerated uh, AI solutions um, in their environments. I think, uh, uh, as Ed mentioned, um, uh, prior to this role, uh, I was the chief analytics officer for New York City. Uh, and the director of the mayor's office for data and analytics, uh, more affectionately known as MODA. Uh, we were the first municipal sort of data analytics and data science team um, in cities. And uh, I always like to say I had three uh, particular roles. The first one was to 
uh, uh, own and execute uh, open data. It's great to hear a lot of uh, the work that Ed um, and his team is doing in the open data space. Um, and to hear you, you guys talk about it today and some of these regulations that are coming down the pipe uh, in New York City. New York City was one of the first cities and one of the few cities to have an open data law. And so part of my role was to execute that law. The second was to facilitate data sharing across uh, New York City agencies. Um, and so I always say that uh, agencies knew how to use their own data very well. What was challenging for agencies was learning how to use other agencies' data uh, to help and drive their missions, right? And so part of my role was to help them uh, surface and understand external data sets that were being gathered across the city for them, for specific agencies to use to meet their missions. And then the third, uh, I call, I, I, I refer to Moda as um, uh, uh, an analytics consulting firm with just one customer, and that was the mayor of New York City. And so we often got called in during emergencies, uh, we often got called in during any type of initiative or issue where uh, there were challenges and people felt like data and data science and predictive analytics. And we've implemented some really strong predictive analytics work. And so I'm hoping to have an opportunity to share um, some of those uh, best practices with you guys. That's great. Thank you very much. And Laura, you're up next. Hello. I'm Laura Schul. I'm the CEO of Streetlight Data. We're a transportation analytics company. So what we do is we take advantage of the fact that everything that moves these days has some sort of tracking geospatial device on it, whether that's your smartphone, connected cars, connected trucks, uh, little sensors embedded in the sidewalk, little scooters, everything's got data exploding off it. So there's a huge amount of data, but wrangling all that data and making it accurate and enriched and usable is a huge task. So that's what we do. We take all that data and we do a ton of machine learning, a lot of you know, good old structured heuristic data and analytics, um, and we blend it all and put it into an easy to use user interface so that state agencies and city agencies and ports and whomever else can log in and get answers out of that data without having to be PhD data scientists. Um, so we work with uh, TxDOT and a lot of local agencies, as well as agencies across the U.S. to help them take that data and make better decisions about transportation infrastructure and policy, all about all of that means they're trying to predict the future and make the best decision about what will impact the future and the direction they want to see it. So happy to talk about all that. That's great, Laura. Excellent. And finally, Karen. Hi, good morning. My name is Karen Weintraub. Thank you uh, to everyone. Uh, for being uh, able to be a part of this and for this great panel. Uh, so I am the executive vice president with Healthcare Broad Shield. So the name of our company makes it a little bit obvious uh, what we do, but uh, we detect healthcare fraud. Uh, we work with a variety of commercial and managed care um, insurance companies, several actually uh, in the state of Texas as well. And we take the data from the insurance companies and we also incorporate other uh, external data sources and we run a variety of analytics and present it um, in, a, in a software that users um, from our clients can log into and um, see where there are the most um, potential areas of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, and we also do investigative services as well. My background actually uh, started uh, with data, um, like, like most people on the panel. Uh, I used to actually analyze data for a local police department uh, and um, kind of parlaying that to various state agencies, Department of Health and Public Housing, um, until I found my way into the, the healthcare arena um, soon after that. And I realized I could combine my knowledge of data uh, and, and really be a good investigator. And I actually investigated fraud for, for many, many years and used all of that to help um, kind of create Healthcare Fraud Shield. We've been around about 10 years. And um, so we've been you know, really excited uh, to see what, uh, what we're doing and, and, and what, where we're going with, uh, with technology. So happy to be a part of this today and looking forward to, to answering questions. That's great. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so as you can tell by the introductions, there's quite a variety of, and diversity here of experience. And, and I'm looking forward to having this dialogue with the team here. So let me jump right into the first question. And I'm going to start uh, with Stephanie on this, and then we'll alternate as we go through the various questions. Uh, again, if you have questions throughout or in your mind now, please put them into the Q&A, and, and we will 
get to them at the end of the uh, session here. So uh, Stephanie, from your perspective, what is the definition of predictive data analytics and how have you leveraged predictive analytics within your specific areas of expertise? You, you touched upon that in your intro, but maybe starting off with the definition of data, uh, predictive data analytics. Thanks. Um, we use the traditional notion of predictive analytics, you know, where we're asking the question, you know, what will happen? And we're using the data that's typically structured and somewhat in structure, unstructured. We still rely on some of the descriptive analytics where we're asking what happened or what is happening. And we're using structured data. And we also lean over into prescriptive statistics. So we're looking at what should I be doing? Why should I be doing? And that's where we're starting to move over into the unstructured as well as the structured data. So basically traditional definition of predictive analytics, but we leverage predictive analytics in a really wide variety of contexts in cyber. So if you think about cyber security from risk perspective, right? You have your attackers and they're external and internal. And that's what we call your threat. Then you have your weaknesses, which is kind of like the vulnerabilities and then you look at what can happen to you and that's your consequences or your impact, right? And we're always using predictive analytics to understand these three contexts. So we're looking at the threats, first of all. We're looking at what's coming after us and how. Is it ransomware? Is it fissures? Is it malware? Is it an advanced persistent threat or APT, which is where somebody's sitting in your network? And predictive analytics is great for identifying these issues, especially when we start throwing in the artificial intelligence and machine learning. If you look at, oh dear goodness, if you look at the vulnerabilities, excuse me, yeah. the vulnerabilities in our network, our databases, our apps and devices, we use predictive analytics across a wide variety of areas with the vulnerabilities also. So we use predictive analytics with just basic Bayesian regression when we're looking at what's called the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or CVSS. And that lets organizations have a standard definition of the vulnerabilities on our network. So it's really great, we can have a common language. We start moving predictive analytics up a little bit more on the notch when we're looking at artificial intelligence wave two. So we're starting to use um, some machine learning supervised and that gets really interesting because we can look at the network and what's going on. So network traffic analysis or NTA, we see how the organization is performing and we can identify anomalies. And then we can move into a little bit more machine supervised also with the SIEM. So that's the security incident and event management. And that gets really cool because we start introducing the idea of self-supervised as well as supervised machine learning. So finally, what is the coolest thing, and it's starting to come out, is actually looking at threat hunting on your network and at the, looking at the advanced persistent threats. So our predictive analytics runs the gamut from descriptive, predictive to prescriptive, and it's across the context of the threats and the vulnerabilities and the impacts. And um, also FYI with artificial intelligence, we're really oozing into more and more of the prescriptive analytics. So it, it's very exciting. That's great. And, and you know, I think the tie that you made on the AI side of things is so, so important of how mm -hmm. it can be leveraged, how those emerging technologies under the AI branches are extremely important in this space. So oh. excellent, thank you. Fascinating. Uh, all right, let's move to uh, Amin. You want to give us uh, your what's your definition of predictive analytics? Yeah, I, let me let me answer that question because I think there's you know predictive the term predictive analytics has gone the way of terms like big data and smart cities. They mean uh, nothing and mean everything, right? And so mm -hmm. let, let me see if I can focus this specifically around municipal uh, analytics. The, the the first thing I'll say is if you're doing work. Uh, in state and cities to be relatively careful about the term uh, predictive because um, in, in my time in New York City, we've never really sort of predicted that anything was going to happen. Um, and there, there's a lot of challenges uh, around that. And I imagine Karen, who spent time with PD and done data work with PD, there's a lot of concerns around sort of 
uh, predicting something uh, can happen. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, we worked a lot with the fire department and uh, their EMS uh, uh, team. Um, and we stayed away from this idea of predicting where um, EMS um, vehicles would need to go. Reason being is if my team predicted where we should set up EMS vehicles uh, to, to be able to quickly respond um, and something happened in an area that those vehicles weren't, uh, then we were uh, attributable to uh, anything bad that happened, right? So you you, you want to stay away from predicting. What we did in the municipal, what when we talk about predictive analytics, we really talk about sort of linear or, or even nonlinear regression. We talk about what are patterns that we've seen over time, and where can we, with a high level of confidence, um, say something may happen somewhere, right? Um, and so again. For in a municipal setting, predicting isn't saying, well, this will happen here uh, in, in this way. What you're saying is we've learned over time, all right? We've seen data from 2020 to 2013, and we've learned over time. And we believe with this level of confidence, with this amount of uh, 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 caveats that goes with this, um, biases in the data and so on and so forth, we think these things will happen. And so for us, we never really uh, introduced predictive analytics. We really introduced sort of uh, 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 communication protocols to sort of uh, have that conversation. So I, I, I would just sort of wrap that up by saying in a municipal setting, I think predictive analytics has uh, places uh, and different definitions in different places in the municipal setting. For us, it was about understanding uh, uh, the, 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 the past, and being able to have some level of confidence in some things that will happen somewhere uh, in the future. <laughs> That's great. And it's actually good for state government as well. So we wanna make sure we kind of leverage that type of methodology going forward. Uh, okay, so Laura, uh, how about yourself? What's the definition of predictive analytics from your perspective? So in our perspective, I think what Amin said is it really resonates. Um, a lot of times policymakers will ask the transportation industry, you know, if I build this highway, how many jobs will it create? How, what percent will it reduce congestion by? And then how much faster can people get to work? And that is an impossible question to answer. Um, so, and that we have to do a lot of education of higher level stakeholders to say, you know, it's not about a predictive analytic that guarantees the future. It's about understanding the drivers and understanding the 14 things that could happen and finding a solution that's reasonably robust across those 14 solutions. Um, so I think that that in, in different contexts, predictive analytics has to mean something very different. In our world, um, we use predictive analytics in two ways. One, I think is closer to what Stephanie was talking about. We process trillions and trillions of pieces of data and we need to make it not cost like $50 million a year in server costs. So one of the ways we use predictive analytics in that, like Stephanie described, where we have supervised and unsupervised ML is within our cloud environment. Um, and we are using it to minimize compute costs. So there's a huge amount of predictive analytics, understanding the load our customers and we put on the servers last night, how should it be orchestrated to minimize costs? So that is definitely behind the scenes and not about transportation, but it's actually our most impactful use of classic predictive analytics. Another way we use it is we use something that was known in the past to help us predict what some new data that we don't understand as well really means. And that's a classic machine learning. So as an example, one of the hardest things to do that we do is if you see a phone going around in a reasonably congested city, it's telling if it's a bus, a car, or a bicyclists, because they can all go about the same speed and look very similar, especially the bus and the car. So we have tons of people who walk, bike, bus, drive around cities and we know what they do because they tell us and we use those as a machine learning data set. So when we get a bunch of untagged data in, we predict, it's sort of like we're using the past, to the far past to predict something a little past of us. We use that data to predict, okay, that is probably a bicyclist and that is probably a bus rider versus somebody riding in a car right next to the bus. So that's another place where we use that casting um, as a form of prediction. All right, just a follow up question on that. So, you know, if you determine it's a bicycle or it's a car, 
what does that tell you? How do you leverage that information, yeah. that distinguishing data? So, um, say a city in Texas is deciding, is um, laying out, and I think this is happening right now in Texas, a bunch of cities are proposing their first uh, new active transportation plans, which means their plans to promote walking and biking in a safe manner. Because in most of the US, for the past several years, deaths of pedestrians and bicyclists have gone up. And everybody sees walking and biking as a critical solution to reducing congestion, reducing climate emissions, and improving public health. So this is a big, knotty issue. So the city needs to know bicyclists, there's you know 10 bicyclists a day here, but there's 100 bicyclists a day on this road. But this road doesn't have a bike lane, but clearly the bicyclists find it the best. So they're going to prioritize this lane, this road for a bike lane. Or they might find that um, this road has 10 bicyclists a day, this road has 100 bicyclists a day, but on average, one bicyclist dies on each of those roads a year. In fact, the, the road with only 10 bicyclists a day is much more dangerous per bike trip. So they might want to try to get all the bicyclists you know, using bike lanes and signage over to this road or think about other safety considerations on the first more dangerous road. That's a way they would use the derivatives of that data about who is biking and who is walking to make a decision about the future. That's excellent. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, Karen, uh, definition of predictive analytics from your side. Sure, uh, I'll echo some of the, the same um, words that were used, but really um, trying to figure out um, what will be a problem. Uh, and we do this in a couple of ways, you know, with healthcare fraud, uh, one of the challenges is that oftentimes there's a gap between when you've identified an issue and when you're able to do something about it. So how do we use data to figure these things out faster to get to the point where we're, we're finding the fraud faster? So we use a couple of different things with predictive analytics where first we use supervised models. So we're looking at known targets. Um, and with our company, one of the benefits that we have is uh, we actually have the outcomes of known targets and we have the results of that. And I know that can be a challenge uh, at times if you don't already have kind of a, a, a result set knowing what things um, came to be uh, of an investigation of fraud, you know, you don't really have a good data set to, to use in a supervised model. And, and that we actually have, we work with a, a lot of different payers. So we've got a really good data set to use what we know did happen to predict what we think will happen. And then we also use unsupervised models as well, um, because you know, they're gonna be things that you don't necessarily know have happened that will happen. And you need to kind of use a combination of both uh, because we wanna also be on top of what might be emerging because there are things that are gonna occur in the future that have never occurred in the past. So those unsupervised models that do a lot of, um, a lot of anomaly detection are really helpful. So the combination of those two um, in our predictive analytics efforts have really been a successful formula to kind of covering all, all the different bases to help identify claims that um, shouldn't be paid both in a post-payment world as well as applying it in a, in a pre-payment world in, in, in my industry. That's great, thank you. Um, okay, well, so everyone kind of gave us a, a very excellent definition and how you're leveraging predictive analytics in your space. What I'd like to now is turn to some questions that are focused around the public sector. Um, obviously, our, our participants today are public sector. They're thinking probably how to use and leverage data in their particular world. So maybe you can provide them some insights into these questions. So we'll start. I think we'll start with Karen this time because I'm kind of I always keeping her to last. So I'm going to start with her first this time. Uh, no Karen, what, why is predictive analytics important? to the success of the public sector. Sure. Uh, so I was think, thinking about this um, maybe in a little bit of a different way. And in, in my industry, we actually do have some involvement in the public sector in the sense that we work with um, managed care organizations. So there are companies that deal with things such as Medicaid and CHIP and other types of, of in, you know, um, organizations at the, mm -hmm. at the state level. Uh, and it's important to the extent success of the public sector because we all have a vested interest in it. So we all wanna make sure that these programs are running efficiently and effectively and that there's not um, you know, any kind of bleeding um, and any kind of potential risk, whether it's financial risk or potential risk to the beneficiaries um, in the organization. So you know, I think we all have a vested interest, not just from managed care, but just the public in general of 
trying to keep those premiums down. Um, I think almost mm-hmm. everyone I know their premiums just keep going up and up. It's not abnormal. Um, and we hope that the work that we do may help to, to reduce those increases by identifying those potential areas of fraud, waste, and abuse and, and recouping and saving and preventing money from um, you know going out the door that should never have been been there in the first place. So that's kind of my perspective on it. Yeah, extremely important. I mean, we saw that um, particularly like in the Workforce Commission here in Texas and probably across the country with fraud activity related to unemployment claims as well. Uh, I know that's not your particular vertical, but uh, I see some parallels on that for sure. So, okay, Laura, how about you? What uh, what do you think is important for the success uh, to the public sector in this space? So I'm very, you know, myopic on transportation. So for any public transportation official, the gamut of change and uh, sort of dynamism that's coming, that has been coming for the past 10 years and is coming in the future 20 years is absolutely bonkers. So we are in a world where uh, our infrastructure is, not doing well. We need a huge investment just to keep the stuff we have working. Plus there's Uber, plus the pandemic changed the way we think about the commute, which used to be the core of all of our transportation behaviors. And then there's the rise of delivery and then there's gonna be autonomous vehicles. And I know uh, Dallas and Houston are some of the cities that are being targeted for the first intra-urban air systems, which is like little helicopters, little helicopter Ubers to take people around. Like just the level of changes is nuts. And to think you can tackle all that while trying to keep deaths down, while trying to mitigate climate emissions and the equity issues that come with uh, transportation and equity, like to do that without a really robust data and predictive system um, that helps you look out a day, an hour, as well as 20 years, it's just insane to think you can manage that level of change about something that's so huge without a really robust data and predictive analytics system. So I think predictive analytics are just going, you cannot manage complex systems without some form of sophisticated, integrated big data and predictive analytics and transportation is about as complex as it gets. Though healthcare would be one of the other ones that's about as complex as it gets. Yeah, that's great. So I'll be signing up my Uber helicopter ride soon. So that, that sounds great. I saw, I saw the prototype helicopter they have. Wow, okay, yeah. excellent, excellent. Uh, Amin, you wanna uh, talk about from your perspective, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and by the way, these are really great, uh, insightful questions. Um, I think the way, the, the, the way I tend to think about data and predictive analytics in the public sector space is that, um, you, you know, you, you think about it from um, uh, the public servants perspective and, um, you know, whether it's Texas, New York, the federal government, we're blessed to have public servants who come in uh, every day and, and do a job. And the idea is data and analytics should not be used to replace their work. It should be used to add value to the, what they do, allow for them to do their work um, uh, in a more timely fashion. I didn't say faster, but in a more timely fashion. Um, we as public servants uh, and public sector folks are always looking to, and because we have to most times, Um, be efficient with how we spend resources. So be efficient with uh, resource spend. Um, And then also what's very key, and we we tend to leave this out sometimes, is we have to uh, work with some level of precision uh, oftentimes, right? Um, And and so one, I I wanna first clearly state that in the public sector space, data and analytics, uh, AI, machine learning, whatever you have, is meant to add value um, and, uh, and, and be a capability that public servants can use to continue doing uh, the work that they do. I think the other thing is that over my time in, pub- in the public sector, one of the things that I've been able to do uh, over time is understand data science patterns and things, problems that we saw uh, in the municipality in municipalities um, on a consistent basis. So after I left New York City, I went to Harvard Kennedy School and served as a fellow there uh, in the Civic Analytics Network, where I worked with other uh, uh, chief data officers from across cities and states to understand some of the challenges. So for instance, you know, prioritization, right? Where to go first? Uh, public sector needs 
data and analytics to help think about that problem. Scenario analysis, you know, the what if question, um, public sector needs. You know, we talked about, uh, some panelists talked about anomaly detection. That's a key thing in the public sector space, right? Um, matching what goes with what we've got data from one agency and we need to figure out how best to match it with data from three other agencies right uh, estimation and one of the biggest ones is targeting right targeted outreach where to look for something uh, and i always say that um in a state or a city looking for that uh that that rundown home or looking for that uh bad building or uh, that bad person or this a uh, bad incident that, that could be taking place is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, data and analytics helps to burn down that haystack such that the people who come in every day uh, to do that job, the inspectors and other folks, caseworkers, um, have less of a challenge uh, wading through that haystack in order to um, uh, hit their mission. Love that analogy on burning down the haystack. I think that's really important to get to the core of what you're looking for. So, and then uh, Stephanie, what, uh, what are your thoughts on this topic? Hi, well, first of all, everything that everybody said, that was awesome. Um, absolutely, I'm, I'm learning as we go from this conversation. Um, and Amen, thank you, because I was an auxiliary officer with NYPD for many years. And I remember when you guys rolled out CompuStat and we used to just have our beat, and we'd go patrol it. And then all of a sudden they were saying, the boss, they all say that we're gonna have this data analytics. And uh, it, it did have some resistance, but it was grand because instead of just walking around and doing our beat, we actually would be targeted. They'd say, we've had a, a lot of hits over here at 86th and Lexington where people are going in, they're stealing money and then they're jumping into the subway stations. So they would boost up our activity there and it worked beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, I work mostly with the private sector and specifically the financial services industry. And what I would really like to see, this is my wish list, is that we could have more of the private sector knowledge, especially financial services, and be able to leverage it into the public sector. Mm -hmm. So I think we'd have some really amazing developments. Yeah, that's really important. I've worked in the private sector and certainly have spent the last 15 years in, in the public sector, but there's a lot of lessons to be shared and learned and tried because I think you can you can benefit and build up your programs and your mission, all of it, uh, by learning from and collaborating with multiple sides and, and Academica too. Uh, I think we don't want to leave them out because I think there's a lot of great thought leadership in those spaces that are bringing some information that we all can benefit from. So, okay. Um, next question I wanted to hit is, uh, what are the biggest challenges to increasing predictive data analytics amongst the public sector workforces? And obviously there's the common things like budget and resources, but I wanted to see if you had some other thoughts around that. So I think we'll start with Laura. Yes. Two things. First, in transportation, there are actual regulations around what technologies and what best practices can be used to predict the future of transportation, and they are very old fashioned. And so there's an inherent conservatism to saying, well, you know, we're making a billion dollar highway expansion project, so we want to use tried and true methods. And as a result, AI predictive analytics in the sense we're talking about it are not allowed to be used in predicting longer term transportation outcomes. So that's that's just a straight up regulatory, just you can't. Um, there are some areas of transportation that are a little more flexible, but for the big infrastructure decisions, there's not flexibility and openness to new technology. So that's a big one. But on a more sort of operational level, I think the biggest barrier is having the data normalized and available. Um, so again and again and again, and I see this most when we see PhD students or master students or whatever come into agencies where they're like, I have this amazing predictive model. And if you just have this data, you can predict like exactly when the left turn signal should turn green, but you never have that data. And so you have these incredibly fancy models that are useless because a model, even a predictive model is only as good as the data that you point in. So at a systemic level, it's collecting data that is normalized by which I mean the data coming out of Houston looks the same as the data coming out of Dallas 
and is in a similar format and is consolidated because only then do sophisticated predictive models work. And people who get educated in the predictive data models want to do the sexy fun stuff, which is like do the Python code and, you know, make the cool machine learning things, not the not so sexy stuff of collecting and finding a way to have normalized data. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think, you know, that's the hard part is cleaning and organizing and instilling quality into your program so you can get your data across all the disparate systems normalized so that you can do proper reporting. Uh, and then you can obviously lay that out to the next level of predictive analytics. It doesn't, it doesn't help you to do it when you don't have a normalized data format across everything. So. And that tends not to get funded. Like yeah, yeah. data maintenance, yeah. Does not get funded it, as much as it should. Yeah, exactly. And it's a heavy lifting and mm -hmm. that has to be done across the board for sure. So uh, Karen, your perspective on, uh, on this question. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything Laura said about having, you know, just good data. Uh, we always say bad data in, bad data out. Uh, uh, but, you know, a couple of other things and just thinking about even my own experiences when I did work in the public sector over 20 years ago, um, you know, I know you already hit on it, budget and resources, you know, obviously having um, the budget to even uh, get the right technology in place. I worked on old databases when I worked at the Department of Health on a, uh, an old project called the National Violent Death Reporting System. So very uplifting set of data, um, you know, but it was just this old, yeah, I know, old, old database um, with very little ability to even analyze it. And I think about how far things have come but even today, it's one thing to have even the right technology, but you also need the skill set of the individuals who are looking at the data. And especially in healthcare fraud, I see a lot of data scientists. And to be upfront, I am not the data scientist. I just dabble in data. We actually have um, a whole team of data scientists that I work very closely with. And oftentimes you'll see things that um, they'll identify in the data, but you really need that combination of, of the data science team and the subject matter experts. And sometimes you're gonna have someone who's both, um, but you need to really have the skill set of the people to understand what the outputs of the data are saying. And, I, and mm -hmm. I see that time and time again in this industry. And it's really, really, really important to have that joint combination, um, whether it's one person who can do both or, or people who work together um, to be able to continue to vet um, and kind of, you know, retrain the models and, and rework them to, to get it where you need it to be. So I would, I would say um, skill set is, is key. Yeah, I agree with you. That's uh, one of the hard things in public sector to compete against private sector for some of the positions and the salaries associated with, with the roles necessary to perform these, these functions. So um, Stephanie, uh, how, what's your perspective? Okay. Um, well, absolutely what Laura said about the data normalization and the consolidation and what Karen said with the skill set, those are key things. We also see two issues in terms of awareness, and I'm going to say resistance, and uh, it's at both levels in terms of the leadership and employees. So with the awareness, a lot of times what we see, and, and I think part of it is we've got the cyber lag because there's always a balance between um, business efficacy and security, um, but also with the predictive analytics piece of it, leadership is often not really aware of how analytics can support the organization's security. And the other piece of it is that they're not as attuned to all the nuances. So a key thing, like we've mentioned before, is having clean data. Um, and that takes a lot of time and effort. Um, relatedly with the employees' awareness, a lot of times they just don't buy into the idea of, well, partly security, um, but then the analytics that can drive the security. In terms of the second piece, which is resistance, I'm amazed at how much resistance we get at a leadership level to having the analytics effort and funding going into these activities. I mean, we have these really cool the SIEM that I mentioned, the Security Information and Event Management programs, and really interesting ways of detecting responses, but we need to have support for it. And I, it's just the resistance thing just blows my mind at a leadership level. And I have to say, you know, I'm kind of guilty at an employee level with the resistance. When we had CompuStack come in with NYPD, everybody was kind of like, oh yeah, let's see if this works. 
-hmm. So, um, yeah, and I agree, it would be um, a wonderful way, again, I want to reiterate how we could possibly link the private and public sector. Maybe we can talk about that another time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, is really relevant there. So, um, Amin, you want to briefly talk about this from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I'll just add to every um, smart thing that was said before me. Um, uh, I, I, when you first asked the question, I'm reminded of uh, sort of Peter Drucker, who's a, a, a management guru, you know, his statement around, you know, um, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so if you don't implement specifically in public sector, if you don't implement the right culture, um, uh, there's no amount of accurate and game-changing data science and machine learning and AI that you can um, uh, execute on that can be used to uh, have an impact uh, in your um, city or state, right? And so I'll give you, for instance, in New York City, uh, when I was there, we spent around 10 million, a little less, uh, to, to, to invest in Palantir. Palantir is a tech company out of Silicon Valley. We invested in a Palantir product uh, a full capability, so on and so forth. We gave it to uh, the mayor's office for criminal um, uh, 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 justice, and um, they were doing inspections, all sorts of inspections for the mayor. Uh, a year and a half later, they're like, yeah, we use it. Uh, basically, when we go and do inspections and we go knock on doors and we do our job, we use it to write notes into, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was a, a very expensive case management tool for yeah. them. Um, notepad. And so, but that's because we didn't implement a culture of using these tech, these complex technologies and in, 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 in using this. And then the second, and I think uh, uh, trust, right? Trust is very important. And, and, and trust uh, has a lot of things, but I'll just talk about one, which is um, understanding and having trust that the data that has been collected and the data that is being used to solve problems in your city or state um, uh, accurately represents what the user, right, the, the, the public servant believes that it represents, M meaning understanding the bias that has been introduced in that data. I have a, uh, a statement that um, every data set, period, point blank, is biased. Your job as a public servant is to understand how that data has been biased and what bias was introduced and then to mitigate for that bias. But, but, but make no mistake, every single data set that you use in some way, shape or form uh, is biased. Just by the, the fact that it exists in the first place, someone decided to collect and store that data um, as opposed to some other piece of data, that person introduced bias just by virtue of collecting and storing that data versus some other data, right? And so understanding that and then using that data to execute on things uh, and then being transparent about those things uh, engenders trust between you, the public servant uh, and the community member. And when that trust is there, you'll actually see more and more and more agencies and entities within government doing more things with data and analytics. That's why the, the number one reason I found that most agencies don't uh, 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 in an expansive way use data and analytics is because they're like, I'd rather send two people out to go knock on that door and talk to that person uh, rather than you know, um, use some, put some sort of data analytics between me and the people uh, in the community, right? But when we can build that trust, uh, 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 I think you'll see uh, more and more data and analytics uses across cities and states. Absolutely, some ex great insights with that particular question. And you know, it's hard to break muscle memory. It's hard to break that. And I think these new technologies and new, you know, technology adoption, you know, is a hard thing to basically do. I mean, if you don't develop a change management kind of program running alongside of your technology implementation, it may have a challenge in being adopted, like you had mentioned on that. Well, looking at the time, and unfortunately, I have some really other great questions, but we're not going to be able to fill it all together. We do have some audience questions, though, that I do wish to, to get to in the next couple of minutes here, and we'll be wrapping up in about, um, what was it, 15 minutes? 15 minutes. So let's go to the Q&A, and then we can go from there. 
So the first question is, what tools are mostly used? Is there a defined model for predictive analytics? Would someone like to jump and, and answer that question? Stephanie, yes. I'll go. My big thing was uh, statistical research methods. So, you know, when you look at predictive analytics, right, we, we actually break it out according to what we're trying to do and what types of data we have. So when you look at the predictive part, right, we may have continuous data like weight, temperature, or we may have categorical data. So it's like apples and oranges. And that actually drives how you're going to start out with your models. So if you're doing prediction, then you're going to want to pull into how much data do I have? If I don't have a lot, I can do like what's called A-B testing. And it's literally just saying yes, no, yes, no. Whereas if you have more data, then you have more options. And again, this is there's a lot of assumptions that underlie the classical, for example, linear regression. And we always want to know what our data has in terms of error, how it was collected and outliers. But we can break down into continuous and categorical data again, and we can use all different kinds of models to be able to figure out what is a trend, what is a regression line. So that's like an average one. What are our anomalies? Um, so it, it, the tools and the methods are really driven by what kind of data you have, how it was collected, and also, what are your research outcomes? I mean, ideally, you have the data and then you're able to figure out the questions. But usually, a lot of times now in cyber, we're actually relying more on that second and third wave of AI. So our machine learning is either supervised or self-supervised. So we're actually flip-flopping it and seeing how those models can work. It's a really interesting area. Hope that answered your question. It did. Thank you, Stephanie. Any of the other panelists want to? Chime in on that particular question. Um, I, I would just throw in there, um, you know, geospatial tools are really key, especially in a public sector space, right? I always say that something in a city always happens somewhere. The most important data we had was geospatially tagged data because nothing, even if the mayor wanted to do budget analysis, budgeting was most important when you were looking at the different boroughs and the different neighborhoods and how best to budget based on where hospitals were, um, uh, uh, clinics and schools and so on and so forth. So you're always asking where something is. So I think um, a key uh, tool is any geospatial uh, technology that you can bring to bear. And then second, I think um, uh, I would add to this conversation around tools is that most things, in, and again, I'm speaking from the public sector perspective, most things you're not going to do an analysis just because you walked in that morning and something, you know, while you were having breakfast, something popped in your head. Somebody somewhere, governor, mayor, uh, uh, senior advisors, just asked you a question, right? And so the biggest tool that you have is to understand the lay of the land when that question is asked. Um, and so um, I think Stephanie talked about sort of prescriptive analytics. You really want to do um, uh, sort of an exploratory data analysis. So any tool, any tool, simple tool, whether it's Python, you know, Jupyter Notebook, Python, uh, geospatial technology, any simple open source, easily downloadable, even uh, Excel spreadsheet, quite frankly, anything that gives you the ability to do some exploratory data analysis. What data do I have? Let me ask it some quick questions. And the key there is any answers you get back from that will allow for you to then uh, direct your next sort of um, uh, uh, piece of action. So I would say a simple exploratory data analysis tool, but then add in on that a geospatial tool. That's great. And we're very familiar with the Excel tool here in state government <laughs> used predominantly here. Um, Laura, Karen, you have anything else on that question? No, except I agree. And if any of the big uh, BI tools are on this call, it is really annoying how bad the geospatial capabilities are in the BI tools, because it means people have to use two tools and then fuse them together. And that is a huge problem. So could they please get better at geospatial? Good point. <laughs> Good advice for them. So, okay. 
All right, next question we have is, uh, can we talk more about specifically what you mean when you refer to data normalization? I think Laura or yeah. Karen brought that out. So. so I think there's two things that I meant and that are typically meant. The first thing I meant is, probably I should have said standardization. So that is having data that is collected in multiple places across multiple years in the same way with simply said sort of the same columns so that you can quickly fuse the data together. So I'll give an example um, where Texas is actually pretty good, which is crash data. So in many states, crash data is collected by police in different counties and they each have their own form, right? With different columns and sort of different codes for fatal crash versus serious injury versus minor injury versus alcohol involved versus whatever. And it is a huge challenge to understand and then to do data around and predictive analytics around say regional or statewide safety. Texas, I think maybe 10 years ago, like some other states, mandated for crashes above a certain threshold that the police code them the same way and submit them to a central database, which has enabled huge leaps forward in understanding safety on Texas roadways. Um, and a few other states like California did it, I think Illinois did it. So that's an example of a statewide program that let anybody, researchers, state agencies, companies, whatever, do real predictive and thoughtful analytics around safety that was totally impossible before because no one city has enough data to really understand what's going on. Mm. That's a great so that's, example. And the other thing about normalization um, is I agree all data is biased to do the best you can to de-bias in the most obvious ways by weighting your sample and doing statistical expansion. Excellent, thank you. Anyone else wanna chime in on the normalization question? I can, I can add to that. Uh, we deal with this constantly um, with, with our clients, uh, even, um, even not even combining data sets, just within their own data set, there are instances where the data needs to be normalized. You know, within one particular column or one particular field, there are values that are inconsistent, whether it's because it's due to something that's been manually entered on their side, the things that are spelled differently. And if you don't have things that, that are the same, that are supposed to be the same, it creates multiple values that really are one value. Um, so we go through this, I can't tell you, in hundreds and hundreds of fields, I'm sure everyone, everyone knows. Um, and that's just looking at one column of one data um, element. And within one client, we could actually also be combining different sets of data. Some insurance companies actually work with multiple claim systems and they want it all combined into one fraud, waste and abuse solution. So. Each of those sets of data need to be normalized individually and then together uh, to make sure you have a clean data set to be able to analyze things accurately as best as you can based on the data that we're provided. So it's definitely uh, an effort um, that takes time to get the data right. So when, when people want to implement any kind of system, you know, and they want it implemented tomorrow, um, you can implement it tomorrow, but it's not going to be clean. Uh, you need to actually have make sure you have a little patience and make sure we get the data right. Otherwise you're gonna go through that exercise all over again. Definitely, definitely, great. And, and can I add something to that just Certainly. briefly? Um, I, I completely agree with everything that has been said. I'll just add that none of this work uh, happens um, at the time somebody needs something. So you have to start thinking about that now um, for the case that will happen in the future. The, 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 and Ed, you, you've heard me talk about this concept of data drills in New York City, where we basically sat around and tried to understand how every agency was thinking about the same concept and to integrate our data at that time. Uh, because when things like COVID, when things like 9-11, when things like Sandy, when things like hurricanes or things like um, mm -hmm. ice overs and the, the breaking down of smart grids um, uh, happen, no one, I don't care what anyone says, no one has time to start standardizing and normalizing data when a governor or a mayor is saying, we've got people who, who are in trouble, who are dying, who are already dead, and we need answers now. You're not, you have no capacity to normalize data. And what happens is everybody exports their databases to Excel spreadsheets and starts sending it all over of the yep. city or state. So you yep. need to start these, I, this idea of standardization and normalization has to happen like now to, to be prepared for the next time someone says, here's a question, what if we integrate all this data to solve this particular problem? 
uh, how do we do that, right? And you have to be able to think about that now. That's, you know, it's interesting as you were talking there, I, you know, I used to be in the disaster recovery business continuity space. So we do planning and preparation for perhaps our, our systems going out and what we need to do on there. And we do backups and we practice re, re, uh, reapplying those backups on an alternate site, et cetera. And business continuity planning, we talk about how we can continue the business elements and continue the business processes but the data contingency planning is another element of it and how now we do need to be prepared on that because things like COVID and hurricanes and stuff come and we all need to work together as agencies collectively and how can we pull that information together or plan to pull that information together now. So excellent point it really is. So, um, okay, uh, a couple other questions are coming in here. I'm gonna skip around. We only have five minutes left. So I'm just going to do take pick one here and go. What methods are helpful for approaching people with these data-driven adjustments in government agencies? In cases where industries people might fight for public data to be kept in the same structure, not broke. Um, so I guess what's I'll, I'll take the first part of that question. What methods are most helpful in approaching people with these data-driven adjustments? Um, who wants to chime in on that one? I have one thought, which is, you know, we're a business, two thirds of our business is to public agencies. And when we do these surveys about like, are you happy? What do you like about our offering, et cetera? The, the vast majority of our positive comments are you have great customer service and a great um, sort of onboarding and educational team. They care about that far more than they care about like what our software and data actually says. That's just a very classic change management thing, which is, I think like you can't just drop in a software and assume people are gonna like watch the tutorial videos, though they should, but I don't, I mean, do you? No. So it's, it's very much a change management process and you have to invest human time in it. And then I think the other thing is, don't claim their old way was broken to the people who made the old way. Like that is not productive <laughs> unless they're the ones saying it. Say like, hey, this was an extraordinary effort to do amazing things with the analog tools that were available. Now you can do more that's great too. Like it doesn't mean it was broken if it can be better. Yep, absolutely. That's great. That really is. All right, well, we have one last kind of go around with the panelists. I, I would like to give each one an opportunity to kind of say maybe one last thing, uh, one last advice piece that you would want to give our particip participants. And we'll start with Stephanie. Oh, you're on my there we go. I'm a little yep. slow. That's why I'm no, not allowed to have. There we go. Um, I think that that my biggest uh, advice is to be persistent in your efforts with data analytics. We have so many amazing areas, and you've just seen from the panelists. We've got everything from the different techniques and sources of data to the applications, and the more you learn, the more you realize how much you can go out and explore. For example, Department of Justice, they have some amazing open data sets. When we did our grant for impact of information security on academic institutions, we had to spend quite amount of time cleaning the data and making it appropriate so it could be an open data set. So there's a lot of opportunities like that you can take advantage of, and there's a lot of resources. I would absolutely urge you to reach out to the DIR people and uh, all of us, and we're happy to help. Great, thank you very much. Amin? You know, um, one, thank you so much for having me on this panel. I actually learned something from the panelists and that's amazing. I, um, um, and this is how I always tend to sort of um, able to get smarter about these things is to learn from people in the space. And I really appreciate the opportunity here. Um, I'll just say one of the coolest things that I've ever seen was, Remember when Sadiq Khan, the, the, the mayor of London, was running, um, he, 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 he had spent some time in New York and learned about Moda. And when he was running for mayor of London, he was like, I'm going to do something just like Moda in London. He created LODA, the London Office of Data and Analytics. He won. They set it up. They did a project. It failed miserably. Failed miserably. They were so excited to be data driven and so on and so forth. Failed miserably. The coolest thing that I saw was that they partnered with the local university to publish about an 80 page paper. It's still online to this day, but an 80 page paper about how they thought their methodology, everything they put in place, 
but then why they failed. And there's two things that's key to that. One is transparency, right? They, they, they did not try to hide the fact that, hey, we were so gung-ho about this uh, that we failed. So one, they were transparent with the public. And two, it was clear that they were embracing the lessons learned from that failure. They did not see that failure as something terrible that they should hide from the public and then they should act like they're, they're this amazing entity. They're an amazing entity now. And I would say precisely because of those two key virtues, transparency and the ability to embrace uh, what did not go right. And, and I great. think the folks uh, listening and a part of um, this, uh, you know, I think that's a good strategy moving forward. Yeah, that's really good advice, certainly. Laura? Sure. So I think my one advice would be the fanciest, most sophisticated predictive analytics is not always, and in fact, is rarely the right approach. And if you can find something that is as good or 90% as good, and that is very simple, um, I would advise you to go for that approach because A, it's more easy to explain to your stakeholders so you get the transparency benefit. And B, there's fewer points of failure if you have a less sophisticated algorithm, right? If you need 42 sets of data and then one goes away for whatever reason, funding, then you got a problem. But if you only need two and you have a very good result, that's much fewer points of failure. So don't cut butter with a chainsaw if you don't have to. Excellent. Love that. Karen. I'm going to have to use that one. <laughs> I definitely have to use that one. <laughs> uh, you know, the way I see it, and when we approach, um, you know, various folks with predictive analytics, a lot of people are still afraid of it. They, and this might have been touched on, I think, by someone in a prior question. Um, don't don't let predictive analytics scare you. It's not going to take away anyone's job. In fact, I see it as actually increasing jobs because you're just finding things or doing things so much more efficiently that you can actually bring on additional people to continue to do the work. So, um, for me, my my final thoughts are: don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Um, and continue to keep working with it and reworking with it as, as Stephanie said, persistence, you know, just keep working at it because um, that combination of working at it. And as I mentioned earlier, the working with subject matter experts who understand the output, um, you're just going to continue to make things better and better. Just keep refining the process um, and you'll have some great results. And, you know, when, when we see results of recouping millions of dollars, people that are just not great, good people that have been caught committing fraud and are now in prison, um, you know, for, for doing things that they deserve to be in prison, it makes it worthwhile. Excellent. Well, some super advice for the panelists, from the panelists to the group. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you for your time, for your, all your sharing of all your thoughts and experiences. I think this has been really uh, helpful for our, uh, the state government and higher education, local government representatives. Thank you very much.